Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we're going to look at how to use convolution neural networks, and we're going to start with one of the classic neural network data sets that has been used on many different models other than neural networks as well. This is the mensed digits data set. Then we're going to look at a newer data set that is very similar. It's meant to be a drop-in replacement for minced. It is the men's fashion data set. After we get through these, we'll be able to see more advanced topics for convolution neural networks. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. So you'll notice that I am using Google Colab rather than just simply my laptop like I've done in a number of these videos. We're using Google Colab because we're going to need to make use of a GPU. If we don't make use of the GPU, this is going to run very slowly. We'll literally have things that would take probably five minutes with the GPU that could take two hours without the GPU. So it's very important that you have that GPU available to you. I have a complete video that I'll link to this. It's linked with the class that shows how to use Google Colab in conjunction with this with this course. Basically, if you want to run any of my course material, it's best just to open up the GitHub repository with Google Colab and pull the file in. That's exactly what I've done here. You can see up here I've connected to, to GitHub and I pulled in this class six. Now let's look at how to use this with Keras and convolution neural networks. First of all, let's go ahead and change the runtime type. We do want to use the, so it's saying Python 3.6, Washington University, that's something local. So it would complain about that as soon as I tried to run it because Google Colab doesn't know what that is. That's a local Python environment that I have. I'm gonna switch it to Python 3. Hardware accelerator, we want a GPU. We'll get into TPUs later. And let's go ahead and save. Now, whenever I run things in this, it'll run it with the GPU. So we're going to look at computer vision data sets. There's a couple of them that we see in this course module. And then we get into some even more advanced ones later in this semester. The classic Hello World computer vision data set is the minced digits. These are basically handwritten digits that are 28 by 28 pixels. They have been studied and used to death in research papers. As a result, there's been a very closely related data set added to this called Minced Fashion, which looks very much like this, except it's handbags and shoes and shirts. So you try to detect an article of clothing rather than, rather than digits. But we need to go through the, the mince digits. We want to see how this works because it's it's your typical hello world for, for machine learning and for computer vision. Now where these digits came from, standardized tests. More and more this is becoming online, but you guys have probably done fill in the fill in the bubble sort of standardized tests. Uh, when I was in grade school, high school, and getting ready for ACT exams and SAT, getting ready for college, this is the only way you took this, took this kind of thing. Little did they know that these students were creating perfect computer vision training data because the students would draw like a three into here and then fill in the blank. So you've got your X, which is going to be the what they drew, and the Y, the expected labels, of the, the what they filled in the little blank with. Now there's noise in this data set. Some students, me in particular, when I was taking these things, had really bad handwriting. Some students would lie. They would draw a three here and fill in a four here. It's a legitimate mistake. So that is, that is basically how this works. I also remember some of these exams that I took back in the innocent days before identity theft. You'd literally put your Social security number right on the exam paper. What could possibly go wrong? So that is the minced digits. Minced fashion is basically articles of clothing in exactly the same format as the minced digits. So it's, it's a drop-in replacement. And we will take a look at this data set because it's, it's, it's great. And it's more difficult than minced for the machine learning. Machine learning has gotten smarter, so we need smarter 
not smarter, but harder data sets for the machine learning to tackle. You can see there's shoes, there's pants, there's shirts, dresses, fashion items basically for the neural network to figure out. So instead of 10 different digits, you have 10 different types of fashion. There's also the CIFAR data set, CIFAR 10, we will use because we're going to look at ResNets later in this course. And ResNets, this is the data set that they really distinguish themselves on for the first time. So we'll see how you can apply a ResNet to these full color data set here where you've got different types of airplanes and different types of cars, cats, birds, all these kind of things. By the way, a common complaint of some of these machine learning databases that later ones have tried to fix is what percentage of these are animals? Airplane is not bird, cat, deer, dog, frog, horse. Okay, so a good 60% of that is an animal. So not, not completely balanced as far as the, the features that it's learning. Other resources that I do want to show you. At Stanford, there's an entire course just on convolution neural networks. And just like this course, they make all of the material available on the internet. So you'll want to check that out if you're particularly interested in convolution neural networks. Andre Karpathy is, I've followed his research since he was a grad student. Very interesting guy who does a lot with computer vision. His, his dissertation was on captioning. Uh, you could have a picture of a cat riding a skateboard and the neural network would literally write out in text, cat riding skateboard. That was the image that I think he had as one of the figures in his, in his dissertation. He taught the course at Stanford initially. I think he works for Tesla now, so he probably doesn't teach that course anymore. For Stanford University and all the information is, is online. He also wrote ConvNet.js. It was an early convolution neural network library, completely in JavaScript. Probably these days you would use the Google TensorFlow for JavaScript, but it's worth taking a look at. So we'll look at convolution neural networks. Convolution neural networks, a lot of the application to deep learning and to neural networks in general came from Jan LeCun, who is one of the co-recipients of the Turing Award for deep learning that was, that was awarded to him. Yashua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton. What this does that is really powerful compared to neural networks before and other traditional machine learning models like support vector machines is it can scan. So we've got the digit A here and notice this little box connected to the convolution layer. The convolution layer is one of a couple of new types of layers that we have now. We had dense layers, now we get convolution layers and max pooling layers. We also had, got dropout layers previously in this course, but these are the two new ones. The convolution layer takes this square that is used to scan. So you specify the size of that square, the size of the scanning region, and it scans across the entire image area and it learns as it goes. So if the square was right here, it would learn about the bump on the top of the A, sort of an angle. Now other letters might have a feature such as that, and these filters, they're typically called, or neurons, they're roughly equivalent to the neurons in a, in a normal hidden layer, would learn each of these attributes. Maybe one of them would learn a line that stops here. Maybe one of them learns a line going at an angle. One learns a somewhat perpendicular connection to the line, the bump at the top. All those would be learned by the feature maps. And that's in the convolution neural network, the convolution layers. Feature map is another term for a convolution layer. Then after you've learned this, you might want to subsample it and decrease it to a lower resolution. That is the max pooling layer. We'll see how all of these layers work in a moment exactly. Then you have some additional convolution layers. Now learn to find features on this much reduced map. So since it's smaller resolution, what you're really looking for now is the building blocks that this first layer learned. So this first layer maybe learned bump, 
perpendicular connection, line, and end of a line. Now using just those building blocks, this layer then builds higher level abstractions. So maybe it learns, okay, bump connected to two lines. And then we pass through some fully connected layers. These are dense layers. There's a variety of terminologies floating about on these. Dense layer is pretty much what I've seen them called at least in the last five years worth, worth of literature. And then Gaussian connections. That is pretty much being used then for classification. So the output has 10. So there are 10 different types of digits. It's interesting that he specifies 10 outputs, but has a letter here. Uh, you'd expect maybe 26 if he was teaching it on, but I, the, the paper that this was used a lot in was using mince digits, but you could draw an A and it would probably, might think it's a nine with a weird line on it. But nonetheless, this is, this is the original diagram from LeCun's original paper in 1998 that set the framework for a lot of what was to come. Convolution layers. What you need to specify on them is the number of filters, the filter size, that's the size of that square that's scanning across. Stride is how many pixels that square jumps as it is scanning across. Padding is essentially a border that you put around the image because when that square hits the edge, you don't necessarily want it just falling off the, the edge of the image and not having a full set of, of pixels. So you can put a padding around it, zeros basically, a black background. And you also need to specify some activation function, usually ReLU or one of the variants like, like ProLU or Leaky ReLU, one of, one of that family typically. Convolution layers are basically add weights and add parameters just like the other layers. The amount of parameters that it would add would be the filter size times the filter size because this the scanning square is always square. So the filter size is assumed to be the same horizontally and vertically times the number of filters. And that's just basically weights that are inside of that convolution layer. Since it scans across the entire region of the image, they're often called shared weights because that means that something detected up here in the image can also be detected down here in the image. Positional invariance, basically. You can, something can move and it's still, it's still detected. This is essentially how you would think of a convolution layer as working. You would have this square. Now this is dealing with grayscale. So there's not three individual elements of red, green, and blue on each of these pixels. If this were color, there'd basically just be a depth component and you would have three numbers for each of these. But this blue region is basically the scan and it goes across as it, as it scans and it has to go completely through the entire image for each prediction or each step in the training. Now max pooling layers, this is where you reduce the resolution. So say you wanted to cut the resolution in half. You would take essentially a six by six and you would take it down to a three by three. So it would divide it into these regions and you would take the maximum, hence max pooling layer. Maximum in this cell is eight, so you get an eight. Max in this cell is two, you get a two, so on. And I do have a link here to give, if you want more information on the lower levels of convolution neural networks. So let's have a look at how we would handle the digits data set. I'm gonna go ahead and run this region here and it displays the information. So we've got 60,000 in the training set and 10,000 in the test set. Now notice we are not having to split train and test on our own. They don't want you to for the minced data set. This is because this was used almost in a competitive way for papers. So they wanted everybody using the same training and the same test set so that you could have a reasonable comparison. So if you said that you got a certain result on it, it's not just because you picked a lucky break between train and test. Now, if we want to display the digits, we can simply run this. This shows you what's actually in this, this data set. Now notice too, we did pull the data set directly from Keras. Keras provides this for common data sets as a convenience, but this can be a real pain if you're trying to use your own images. And we'll talk 
about that in a future video, how to pull in literally your own images, raw JPEGs and PNGs. But for now, we'll use the convenience methods. Here you can see one of the images. It's very big. You can see probably some sort of a spiral there. If you want to actually display it, you can run this and it displays it, it's some sort of a one. That's the 105th digit. If you want to pick the next digit, it would display it, which is a six. So this is essentially a heat map that matplotlib provides us. It provides a convenient way to visualize these. If you want to see a whole bunch, you just do subplots in matplotlib. You run that and it will show you a whole bunch of digits. So this is a good way to visualize some of these data sets and show that they really are just images that, that are being pulled in for you. You basically have to take the raw PNG and JPEG files and turn them into tensors, into cubes, height, width by the color depth. Now let's go ahead and build a neural network to train this on. This is where we'll be glad we have a GPU. Doesn't take too much time to actually build this. It shows some of our hyperparameters. We're choosing a batch size of 128. We are doing some basic transformation on, on the data set so that everything is in the right order that TensorFlow wants it. Typically, we, we need a height by width by the color depth. And we will see how to actually do that when, how to do this on raw images when we get into dealing with loading our own images for this. This is important. This is doing some basic normalization on it. So I said that neural networks deal best with data that's always in the same range. Well, you're always in the same range of, of 0 to 255 on the individual color components of RGB. But here, it, this, is, this is getting everything between 0 and 1, since the normal range was 0 to 255. For a little better result, you could even potentially center this about 0. So you'd probably subtract 128 and divide by 128. We'll see an example of that later on. We print out how many training sizes we've got. Here is where we build up the neural network. We add in some convolution 2D layers. You don't really have a convolution 3D. There might be one, but typically you're dealing with 2D because you're recognizing 2D images. It wouldn't surprise me if somebody has figured out a way to send in 3D images for recognition. It'd be interesting how you would capture those. You'd probably need two cameras. But we'll deal just with 2D images, not 3D. Then we put in the max pooling layer, add some dropout. The flattening layer is always needed when you move from these 2D to the dense layers like we've had before. So you always put that flatten in there because that basically, now you can't go back. Once you flatten, you can't use the convolution layers again, or at least not without some extraordinary reshaping in there. Never say never. And then you use a dense layer, and this is classification. So we're using the classes, categories, categorical cross entropy and softmax, just, just like we've had many times before. Now, when you want to train and fit it, now notice these times that I have here. This takes nearly two hours on the CPU and 13 minutes on the GPU. It's not gonna take you that much time on the GPU. This Google GPU that they give you for free is better than my GPU that I, that I ran this on about a year ago when I took those times. So it's awesome what you get for free. Let's go ahead and run this. We're gonna go ahead and train it. This is training code just like we've seen before. I do time it, so we'll see exactly how much time this takes. Now you wanna run that. It tends to take it a little bit of time to get going, but we're already on the first epoch and it's, it's really pretty quick. We're on our second epoch and it, it took really, it's taking only about four seconds a epoch, so. I will go ahead and fast forward this, but it's it's not gonna take much time. Just think, this could be two hours on some CPUs. And there we are, 53 seconds. I love GPUs. Now there's two types of GPU that you're dealing with right now. There's the K80, that, I think that's what it's called, that Google gives you for, for free. That's the cheaper one. It's probably around a $500 to $700 GPU. This is in 2019. This will... I will, I'm sure I will have updated the video by the time this 
that changes radically. There's also a V100, more advanced enterprise one. I use that on Amazon Cloud, and that's probably a six or $7,000 GPU. You would think that it would run even faster on that one, but it, it does not. This is not a complicated enough neural network. It runs about the same speed on this GPU versus the other. So when you are running on something like Amazon Cloud, you need to balance really and not overuse too advanced of a GPU or you're, or you're simply wasting your money. You're dealing with something, the more advanced GPU on Amazon Cloud, at least in today's dollars, it's about $4 an hour versus under a dollar an hour for this GPU that, that Google's giving you for free. So definitely use the Google one. For some of the assignments that I give you, you will need GPU level processing performance. Otherwise, you're going to spend hours and hours and hours training and it'll, it'll take you a long time. So I'll discuss that when we get into some of those assignments because there's separate videos and explanations for each of the assignments. Now let's evaluate the accuracy. Let's just run this and look at the accuracy, 99%. This is why fashion minced was introduced because this this is a decent hello world but what are you going to do if you're trying to do any sort of research on this i mean you're going to be at 99999 it's 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 pointless to say that you increase the accuracy from 99% to 99.99999% now this is another thing that's useful to know too when you're scoring that is sending data to get values back predictions back if you're using a GPU, you might get a resource exhaust error. That is simply because you have thrown too much data at the GPU for it to score at once. So you have a couple of options there. This usually won't come up during training because you're using many batches. But if you're trying to score a big block of like a million rows, it might not fit in the GPU. A couple of options there. Scoring is usually pretty quick. You can just send that to the CPU and it doesn't matter how big it is within reason. Or you can break it up into pieces and send each of those pieces one by one to the GPU. And you would use this kind of code to do it here if I wanted to just score the first 100. So I'll give you an example of, of doing that. Now let's look at minced fashion. Again, we're using convenience methods to load this in so that we don't have to have the data sets of all those fashion items. We're gonna go ahead and run that. It is downloading it. So when you run some of these for the first time, it will download it. If we want to display these, just like before, this is exactly, by the way, the same code as the digits. So I'm not going to explain, re-explain at all. Just gonna kind of show you what it looks like. Let's go ahead and run this. I shouldn't really say digit nine. This is a uh, fashion apparel number nine, which is a shoe. And if we want to display a whole range of them, just like the digits, we can. So there's a block of fashion items that it's trying to. Again, pretty similar training times. I'm gonna go ahead and define the neural network just like before. It's defined. We're going to now train it. And we'll see that the training time is really pretty comparable to what we were dealing with before. Notice the accuracy is not just pegging right up to 99%. It's around 89%. 90%. So this is definitely more difficult. You would have to you'd have to work a lot more to get this up to the higher levels of accuracy. And I have not looked. This is not too much of a real data set. I suppose it's used some in research, but I have not looked at where some of the the more advanced researchers have gotten this up to. But it looks like we're going to be right at around 92% of validation accuracy and it looks like it's Kind of stopping there. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to continue with computer vision and look at ResNets. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.